Welcome back, Geico Outkick Studios. We have got the most Major League Baseball playoff games of all time occurring today. Eight different playoff games. I believe I'm accurate in that respect. John Morosi, you'd know better than me, right? This is the most playoff games we've literally had in one day in the history of of Major League Baseball, which is at least a positive to come out of 2020, which has been an unprecedented year. It's literally a first for Major League Baseball. Well, good morning, Clay. You are absolutely right, my friend. This is the first day we've ever had eight different playoff games happening in Major League Baseball beginning at noon Eastern with the first of them, it's going to be all-day baseball, very reminiscent of an NCAA tournament day. Uh, so this is the first year as well that we've really had a – a full bracket uh, to describe your postseason field. That's been unique. So it's it really has been a, a unique way to begin the year. Certainly uh, yesterday, some very exciting games. Uh, a show of force by the Yankees last night. But it, it really, uh, I think overall, Clay, a good start to the playoffs. And I am excited for uh, a lot of baseball to watch today. All right, before we get into all these matchups, we've already had some results coming in from last night. What in the have you ever seen anything like the Twins losing 17 straight baseball games in the postseason? I mean, it's it's truly almost unfathomable simply from an odds perspective because you have to be a good team to get to the postseason. So it's not talking about the team that's the worst in Major League Baseball losing 17 in a row, which would still be very difficult to do. We're talking about it occurring over the course of 16 years as well. This is remarkable. It really is. And I was actually telling Danny G before the segment began, I, I was covering the game that began that streak. I, I was a uh, young 22-year-old right out of college. Uh, I had a full head of hair back then, Clay. It was remarkable. Uh, I was a, a newspaper writer at the time for the Albany Times Union, and I was there at 22 years old at Yankee Stadium, game two of the 2004 American League Division Series. Uh, Ron Gardner was the manager of the Twins at the time. And actually, Minnesota had a lead late, on the Yankees uh, in Game 2. They had one Game 1. Jock Jones had a big game in Game 1, I remember. And in Game 2, they were supposed to win that game. They were leading late, and then the Yankees rallied against Joe Nathan, Hideki Matsui, I remember, had a big hit. Uh, uh, Derek Jeter was involved there as well. And, and lo and behold, the Twins have not won a playoff game since I had a full head of hair and I was covering that series at Yankee Stadium in 2004. So uh, a remarkable set of circumstances. And they've had some losses in that time that really they should have won. Some some games where they were blown out by the Yankees, of course, their longtime nemesis. But that was a game yesterday against a team in Houston that finished the regular season, Clay, under five hundred and uh, tied late and in a bad throw by Polanco, a shortstop, and, and uh, th- then the predictable happened for all, all Twins fans. So I, I feel badly for my, my friends from the great state of Minnesota, but it's, it has uh, been a long, long, difficult journey for them to try to just win a game, let alone a series. Three of the four home teams lost last night. Obviously, there is no home field advantage. That would suggest that it's really not going to be much at play at all. But Astros, White Sox, Rays, and Yankees all won. Do you think the teams that won game one of the series will all advance, or do you think one of these teams or more will come back and win two straight? That's a great question. The Twins should win that series, Clay. They're, they're the better team. Their pitching has been really good. Uh, they offensively just didn't really have that great of a day yesterday and, and missed some opportunities. I think the Twins find a way to win two in a row and, and, and win this series. As for the others, I, I think the Rays playing at home, very good team, very deep team. The Yankees, after really an incredible offensive display, it's hard to imagine them losing the series after what they did in game one. And then and Oakland and, and the White Sox, Clay, that's an interesting matchup because the White Sox had stumbled so much down the stretch. I think, I think the, the number was if they, if they had won only two of their last eight games, they would have won the division. Instead, they only won one in the regular season. So they finished one and seven. If they had gone two and six, they would have won the division. Uh, so all that disappointment, they fly all the way to the West Coast, where, of course, no Central Division team has played yet this year out West because of the schedule. They fly all the way out to Oakland, and then they, they look great. Giolito is perfect for six-plus innings, and, and, and the rest is history in game one. So I, I, I think that when the White Sox are, are on their game, like it appears they're on right now, they're a very dangerous team, and, and Oakland has their own long playoff uh, 
drought of, of uh, series wins as well. So it's a very interesting matchup there. I, I think now that the White Sox have won game one, I, I like their chances to win game two as well. What do you think happens in the NL with game ones all going on, the four of them today? Sure. So I, I think that, uh, Clay, a lot of eyes right now on the Dodgers. Uh, they're beginning this playoff run as as the presumptive favorite. They're my pick. They're a lot of people's pick. It's not the most imaginative pick, but they also just finished with the best winning percentage of any team in franchise history. Again, I realize it's a 60-game season, but that's a legitimate mark, and they're they're a really great team with a deeper bullpen than they had, I, I think, last year. So, I mean, that that to me is a huge difference for Dave Roberts. Uh, there was there's always going to be conversation about Clayton Kershaw when it comes to the playoffs and 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 his feelings in the past. I actually think he's had some pretty good moments in the playoffs too. Um it's not it hasn't all been bad for Clayton Kershaw, but he's still chasing that World Series ring. I believe this is finally the year when the Dodgers get it and and in terms of the the teams advancing to the first round of the NL, I've got the Dodgers meeting the Padres. I think the Padres will, will be a team that that they play in the division series, which should be a great showdown of those two NL West teams. And then the others, I've got the Marlins beating the the Cubs. Uh, I think they're, the Marlins are the team that no one seems to know, but they have got a lot of young talent. Their pitching is very strong. I, I think they find a way to win that series. And then the Reds, as Joey Votto uh, very eloquently said, a bleeping nightmare, I believe is what uh, Joey said about the team last week after they clinched. They're a very good team, and I agree with Joey. I think they find a way to win that first-round series. Uh, all right, so in this, uh, in this series, for people out there who are listening to us and may not have been paying a lot of attention – so you've got a best of three, which will knock out half of the 16 teams. Those are all taking place in the higher-seeded stadium, though without fans present. And then once you get down to eight, you have the NL going to Texas and you have the AL headed out to California for bubbles. You would have a best uh, out of five, right? And then you would have the ALCS and the NLCS as a best out of seven. Am I correct And uh, in the way that I just laid that out? Yes, Clay, exactly. So um, that, that's the format. And then the, the interesting part, uh, among, I guess, many interesting parts about this season, um, is that there are no off days in the division series and the championship series, which I think really favors the teams that have a lot of depth, like the Dodgers, like the Rays. The, those teams that, that have the pitching to handle that without baking in those off days – where, where teams can rest their, their key starters, start them on short rest, whatever it might be. And we've seen teams like the Giants, you think about Madison Bumgarner six years ago, what they did with him, how often he pitched. That, that kind of approach probably doesn't work now because you just don't have enough days off. So that, that to me, is going to really favor the teams that, that are the favorites, that have the, the really deep and, and excellent pitching, as opposed to the teams that can maybe upset you with one really great pitcher. There's just not going to be, in my judgment, enough days off for one pitcher to dominate a series that way. And and there has been conversation. It's not officially official yet, but the commissioner has talked about wanting to potentially have fans for the championship series and the World Series. Unclear how many, unclear if that's actually going to happen uh, in, in a formal setting, but that is something that baseball has talked about. We're talking to our Major League Baseball insider, John Morosi. How much credit does Major League Baseball deserve, in your opinion, for getting through the season? So, uh, by the end of this week, we'll be down to eight teams. That means 22 teams will be done. Uh, obviously, 14 teams have already been eliminated, so we don't have to worry about the testing and everything else. How uh, exhilarated and excited do you think Rob Manfred is, especially with the way it started with the Marlins having an outbreak so early in the season and then obviously the long ongoing issues that existed with the Cardinals to basically get the entirety of the season in and be able to say, Whew, we got through that, now we're into the postseason, we feel pretty good. Well, it's an incredible achievement, Clay, and it's one that, that I believe is shared by the players and, and the owners and the executives. This was a very difficult year, as we know, for many different reasons, and it took some time, as you pointed out with the Marlins and the Cardinals early, um, for baseball to really perfect, perfect maybe a strong word, but just sort of hone their, their response to whenever a, a positive COVID test happens and uh, it, it took a while but they they realized that it's basically a five-day shutdown uh sometimes longer than that to make sure that you're you're doing the best you can with contact tracing and and isolating of people that have tested positive and and i, I really think that they they set a pretty strong model for how to operate your league 
outside of the bubble. Of course, I think we've had the in-bubble examples of, of the NBA and the NHL, and, and baseball was out of the bubble and, uh, and gathering a lot of information about the best practices. And I think that as each league begins the season, there's more information about how to handle things. And I, and I think overall, baseball, they've had two weeks in a row, Clay, without a player testing positive anywhere without there being a fixed bubble. Now, I say a fixed bubble because the players have been behaving, and I've had execs tell me this, they've been behaving as if they've been in a bubble in terms of uh, keeping things very simple, home, ballpark, ballpark, home. Uh, and, and obviously not, not going out beyond that. You see masks at the stadiums. I actually... Friday, because I had flown uh, the day before when I went to Minneapolis for the first time I had been on a plane since February, I, I had to take a COVID test just to enter the ballpark at Target Field in Minneapolis. So it was, uh, it, you know, the, the, the protocols are there. They, they've, they've done a very good job, I think, of, of surrounding this with a lot of ver- very good science and, and knowledge from a medical perspective. And, and I think the, the MLB and the medical people at MLB and also the union and their people deserve a ton of, ton of credit here because this was a very difficult task. A lot of people thought when the Marlins outbreak happened, Clay, that we wouldn't get to August, let alone October, and, and yet here we are. So I think it's, it's been a shared achievement and one that I hope helps MLB and the union work together on a lot of the difficult issues that will certainly exist, as, including as it relates to next year's schedule and how that's all going to go. So a, a lot of difficult days ahead, but uh, I think to your point, there's, there's a lot of reasons to be grateful and very proud of the way things have gone so far. You mentioned the idea of potentially there being fans present. What do we think that would look like, and how would they implement that so far as you can tell, potentially once they get to Texas, uh, I guess maybe more so in Texas than California? Right. Uh, yeah, that, that's my understanding as well, Clay, that it, it would be Texas and not California. Uh, in terms of the exact percentages, uh, I don't know, to be honest with you, in terms of how exactly how many people w- would be in the stadium. That's probably a, a question that, that will become a little more – uh, a little clearer as we get a little bit closer. But I also think that whether it's the NFL or, or, or the European soccer leagues that you've seen open, there's there's a lot of procedures that are in place about sanitization and and checking of fans as they enter the, the, the building to make sure that they don't have symptoms and, and temperature checks. I, I'm sure it's going to be a relatively small group in terms of the overall percentage of the of the stadium's capacity. But the commissioner is very importantly, Clay, been on record as saying, he believes that it's important for us as a sport, and I say us because you know, baseball is my, my sport that I'm around all, around all the time, that it's important for us as a sport to, to get used to the notion of fans again and how to safely do it. Uh, obviously with masks and, and social distancing and, and all, all those uh, protocols, but that if you adhere to those protocols, that you can have fans again, and, and at least in small numbers. And so I think this is not, I don't think, Clay, this is not about, hey, we have to find a way to get huge amounts of revenue with fans for tickets for two rounds of playoffs. I think it's just as much about, hey, we're going to send a message that we're, we're going to implement some protocols here at a brand-new stadium in Arlington, in Texas, where, uh, where, where the, those two rounds would happen, that, that we believe we can do it safely, and it, and it sends a very important message about how baseball hopes to get back to business in, in, a more, in a more normal, not totally normal, but a more normal way in 2021. Uh, all right, so let's uh, let's dive into uh, into who you actually think is going to be in the World Series. You mentioned the Dodgers earlier coming out of the NL. Who is your AL representative? So I've got the Yankees, Clay, uh, winning the American League. Uh, I, I've got the Yankees winning. Uh, my pre postseason prediction before the A's loss came on is that I would have the A's uh, winning uh, through the division series, meeting the the Yankees and the. ALCS and the Yankees beating the A's in the ALCS, and then eventually the Dodgers uh, meeting the Yankees in in this colossal uh, Dodgers-Yankees historic World Series, which would be won by the Dodgers in seven games uh, there in in Texas. And and how about this, by the way? You think about the the World Series uh, being concluded there in in Arlington, Texas. Uh, That's right near the hometown of Clayton Kershaw. So uh, for the Dodgers to finally win it, if if Clayton's finally going to win the World Series, it's going to be in his hometown, his, his true hometown, of course, where he played uh, growing up baseball and football with Matthew Stafford. So it'd be kind of a cool story from a standpoint of the league and, and what Clayton has meant to baseball over the years as a Clemente Award winner as well and, and all he's done in, in community service. So it'd be quite a story, and, and I do think, Clay, that's what's going to happen. The Dodgers finally find a way to win the World Series. Uh, all right, last question for you. Who are the MVPs? If you're voting, and you may well be voting, I'm not sure. We're talking to John Morosi, Major League Baseball insider for Fox Sports Radio. You can follow him on Twitter, at John Morosi. 
who were the MVPs other than everybody being able to get the actual season in on the field? Who were your MVPs? Sure. So in the National League, to me, it's Freddie Freeman. Uh, for a while, I had thought it was Tatis, but I, 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 your son's going to be very happy to hear me say this. I, I, I yes. trust uh, Freeman. Freeman, to me, overall, his his ability, I think, uh, to, just to carry that that offense. They had some guys hurt at different times. The steady production, what he has meant to that lineup, uh, playing as consistently as he did, of course, overcoming COVID early in the season. I, I think Freddie Freeman is the pick in the National League. To me, he's he's the best. He's the best player there. In the AL, Clay, I've, I, this is like the one time that I've ever uh, said I can't answer the question because I'm a voter and therefore I'm duty bound to not reveal my vote. Ah. I promise you, in in November when when it's announced, I will tell you my entire thought process. But I, this is one of those things where, I, and I'll be honest with you, I had like two different nights where I, I, I was grinding on the numbers. Uh, of course, a lot of different great candidates, uh, especially from the AL Central here around me, games that I've seen a lot. Uh, and, I, and it was like two nights where I had to like make a ballot, sleep on it, wake up, make a ballot, sleep on it. It was like, it was agonizing. So I've, uh, by, by way of the, the voting regulations, can't tell you who I voted for, but I can tell you it was like a super uh, exhaustive process that I feel good about the end, but it took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get there. Should I take, final question for you, should I go take my son out of school to be able to watch the Braves in the postseason because the game is taking place at 11 a.m. Central where we live here in Nashville, noon Eastern. It's the earliest game, and otherwise he misses it being at school. Clay, that is a great parenting question. I, 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 would, I, would, never, I would never tell you how to parent, okay? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I would never make that suggestion. But I would say this. There are often, at, at, at times like this, those, those great permission notes that are written by yes. MLB teams to excuse. So I, I would think that, uh, you know, that especially given the way that your son invested his heart and soul in this team during this very unique year and how it's, the Braves have helped him get through this, this this summer where we didn't have sports and now that you're in the playoffs gosh clay it sounds like that that to me is a is is a really good reason to watch the game especially if he can find a way to write the essay afterward about what the experience has meant and how baseball fits into american life and the fabric of our country and our culture I think that's a really good assignment for social studies. I would say that's a very good reason to miss school today. Outstanding, as always, John Morosi. Eight Major League Baseball games for the first time ever. We'll talk about that a bit as we go to break.